Shabbat Shalom. This is Sharon Gluck with Mind and Messiah Ministries in Farmington, Missouri. We have not recorded for a couple of weeks because I had a conference to do in Utah with Warfare Women's Conference out there, and we did Encouraging the Saints, and it was just absolutely joyful, wonderful. The presence of God and the anointing was just amazing, and I was just sharing with some of our church family here, our community here in Farmington, that I really felt like that God made a distinction for those of us that are keeping Torah, that are walking in his covenant and walking in his commandments, that there was a, an, an amazing anointing. And I just felt like he was uh, honoring obedience. So today we're looking at two Torah portions. It's a double Torah portion. So it's a little long. We're going to try to get through it as judiciously as we can without keeping everybody till they're starving afterwards. But the first one is called Akrimot, and it's Leviticus chapter 16 through 18. And the first noticeable words in this Torah portion is after the death. If you'll remember all the way back in Leviticus 10, we had the death of Nadab and Abihu because they offered up strange fire before God. Everything that we have learned since the time that those boys, young men died, everything we have learned up to this point has been about how to approach God. What do you need to be holy before him? We have all of the food laws. We've been taught what's clean and what's unclean. We've been taught how to walk before God in a way that we can approach him. What's abominable? What is acceptable? Because God wants us to be holy as he is holy. So this second Torah portion is called Kodeshim. Kodeshim is the plural for our Kodesh, our holy, holiness. And Kodeshim are things that we are requested to do by God to cause us to walk holy before him. He tells us over and over in the scriptures and in these Torah portions to be holy as he is holy. Would he tell you to do that if it were not possible? He would not. Would he tell you to become holy as he is holy if it were an impossible thing to do? Ultimately, we become holy and washed in the blood by the blood of Yeshua. He is the one whose sacrifice has taken away our sins and our transgressions. But through all of these Torah portions, we see the sacrificial animals, which we have had in the scriptures between Leviticus 10 and 16. We see how the blood is atoning. Atoning means to cover your sins. When Yeshua sheds his blood, it is a once for all sacrifice, and it is never needing to be made again. Even in the millennial reign, we see that they come up to Jerusalem and that they offer sacrifices, but they are not offering up animal sacrifices because there is no need for a blood sacrifice again. These will be first fruit sacrifices. These will be our produce, our things that have seed bearing uh, vegetables and fruits, things that have seeds within themselves is what we will offer before God. We can offer incense. We can offer prayer. We can be blessing God in other ways, but the blood sacrifice is once and for all. It was made by Yeshua. So even in the millennial reign, there will be no blood sacrifice. Obviously, we probably will not be eating meat during those times because sin and death will be put, put away. If death is put away, then there will be no death to us and no death to the animals. At that point, we may end up having talking animals again. From all of the scriptures or the Apocrypha, we understand that originally the animals could communicate with Adam. We also see in the story of Balaam and Balak, that the animals communicated with those that, that prophet Balaam. So there will be things that would be very different in the millennial reign because we will have become holy as he is holy. And the need for any kind of sacrifice will have passed away. I have said this repeatedly 
I'm going to say it again, was said to my congregation here, that if and when we have a third temple in Jerusalem, no matter how honorable and wonderful you think that is, any blood sacrifice offered up will not be acceptable before Yahweh because there is only one sacrifice and that is the sacrifice of his son, Yeshua. Yeshua is God in the flesh. This is God come to be with man in a flesh body who offered up himself. There is no greater sacrifice and it's already been made. Therefore, any sacrifice after this point will not be necessary. It's also the reason why when we have Passover that we don't sacrifice an animal. We don't cut its throat because we're told in these scriptures this week, we're going to read them, that whenever that you have an animal that you have killed, a clean animal that you have killed it in the field for food, you still have to bring it to the door of the tabernacle and the blood still has to be offered up because the life is in the blood. The life is in the blood. All the blood belongs to Yahweh. He's the one that has given life to every living creature. All the blood belongs to Yahweh. So we will read about that as we get to these scriptures. The first Torah portion, Akamot, was called after the death. This is after the death of Abihu, Nadab and Abihu. It is the, it sets forth the law of Yom Kippur. So we're going to learn about Yom Kippur. It talks about the offerings. It talks about sexual practices. It is constituted or it comes from Leviticus 16 through 18. Kodeshim is a word for holy ones. That's the 14th word in this Torah portion. It goes from Leviticus 19 to 20, that's 19.1 to 20.27. 20, so following the death of Nadab and Abihu, God warns against unauthorized entry into the holy of holies. There's only one person, one time a year, that is permitted to go behind the veil. And that is the Kohen Gadol, or the high priest. So we can see right away what these young men did incorrectly. They didn't wait for instruction. They took things upon themselves. They went running in with strange fire, or probably strange incense. The fire of God had just come down and consumed the sacrifices upon the burnt offering. And the coals for the incense were supposed to be taking off that burnt offering. So when the fire came out from Yahweh, he has just come down and consumed that offering, that sacrifice. And now someone's coming in with strange fire and strange incense and the power of God is still, his presence is still there. And the fire of God comes out again and it, it destroys them, it kills them, it burns them up. That was back in Leviticus 10. So he teaches us in this Torah portion about Yom Kippur, that it only happens one time a year that they go into the interchamber of the sanctuary and they're to offer up what God has determined that they offer up, not doing things our way, but his way. So we've talked about this in Torah portions in Leviticus up to this point, that it's not about doing what we think is right. We keep telling ourselves, well, these holidays that we celebrate in this nation, they are not holy days, they're holidays. And what we say is when we tell them that they come from pagan origins, their answer is, well, that's not what it means to me. It's not about what it means to you. It's about what it means to God. We are supposed to be doing the things the way that he has told us to do and to quit doing things our own way. Man thinks that he is God himself. He has his own way about everything. I talked to someone last night. Actually, he's a disciple. I, I appreciate his love and his concern and how he tries to pattern himself. And he, he said to me, I feel very inadequate. I feel like I need a mentor. I need someone to teach me how to do these spiritual things. And I'm telling him, go in and look at the, at the teachings. 
go to Derek Prince, look at those teachings. You're being discipled as our mentored as you learn those things. All of us had to learn the same way. Well, I want to move in the power that you move in. Well, yes, yeah, so do I. <laughs> I had to earn that. This is 50 years of walking with God that got me where I am. I didn't get here overnight. And in the process, I've learned to quit doing things my way. Do I still do things my way? I'm sure there are. And when I do, God points that out to me. I shared with the group here the other day that I was in a communion service when we were going to convention, that there was a communion service and there was someone standing next to me that we had had a little bit of a rough start. And she happens to be next to me while we're taking communion. And she has no elements. And the Holy Spirit, I'm already crying before the Lord. I'm already repenting for any attitudes, for any judgment, for any, anything that I might have in my heart that is not like God. And he says to me, you're going to share those elements with that sister. And I just go, okay. I'm thinking, God, you're so perfect. You set up the circumstances where we have got to face ourselves. We've got to face our own criticisms, our own judgments. The, the areas where we're not loving, where we're not kind, where we're not forgiving. He wants to judge us on those things on a regular basis. And so as we stood there, I had the little cup and I shared my cracker and I opened the little cup and I said, you drink first. And then I drank after her. There was so much healing in that. There was complete healing for her and for us. Anything that we had rough edges about had, had just disappeared. Because God told us how to do it his way. That we don't partake of communion without searching our hearts, without knowing what God is trying to say to us about us. He's constantly searching our heart. So he's talking to us about the day of atonement in these scriptures. And then in, he also shows us about the casting of lots. There's two goats. We're going to read about that. And then the lot drawn determines which one of those goats will be for Yahweh, a sin offering, or which one of those will be having the sins of Israel plat, uh, placed on them and the goat sent into the wilderness. So this whole tour portion is telling us that anything offered up to God cannot be done anywhere except for at the tabernacle. It forbids the consumption of blood, and it tells us about the laws of incense and any kind of deviant sexual relation. So that's in um, remote. I'm going to get that right. Act remote. Okay. In the Torah portion, Kodeshim, it begins with the statement that you will be holy for I am the Lord your God and I'm holy. And so this is followed by dozens of mitzvot, our commandments that God, divine commandments that God is giving us, they are things that will help us to continue to walk in holiness. He is having in these four portions of forbidding of idols, uh, reminding us of how important the Shabbat is or the, the Sabbath is. And there are moral laws about how to deal in business, how to care for your parents, and how to see the sacredness of life. So also in Kodeshim, the rabbi Hillel said that to him, this Torah portion, Kodeshim, about holiness is actually the entire Torah, the rest of its commentary. And that's because we are supposed to love your fellow man as you love yourself. And that will be accounted or reviewed in this Torah portion. There is a hierarchy of holiness. There's a progression in one's spiritual walk towards holiness. And there's an upward movement that we, we are, the moment that we receive Jesus, we are covered with the blood. Our very inward person becomes 100% um, delivered. We are, we are redeemed by the blood of the lamb, but it is our mind, will, and emotion that has to keep coming in line. We have to keep working on that. So we grow in holiness. We may become the presence or the, the people of God through the acceptance of the blood sacrifice, 
but there is a constant progression of holiness that we can learn to walk in as we learn God and learn his ways. It's the things that are on the inside that make the difference. When we have our thoughts are changed towards God, then our words will change towards God and towards our fellow man. And then our actions, they will come from that as well. Like Jesus said in, um, in Matthew 5, 20, 22, he talks about um, not committing adultery, but then he takes it to a higher level. So the Torah tells us not to commit adultery, but Jesus says, if you look upon a woman to lust after, you've already committed adultery. So there is a progression in holiness. There's a different way of looking at what God first proclaims. There is a deeper level of holiness. If it says, thou shalt not kill, but I say, even if you are angry with your fellow man that you've already committed murder. So some of us look at that and go, well, how did I do that? I mean, that's, that's a really deep thought that we are angry with somebody. And because of our anger, we have thoughts against them that will uh, affect their reputation or if we speak words against them, that we, that we are attacking them. There's lots of ways that our thoughts can murder somebody without actually going through the act of that. So there is a higher level of holiness that God brings us through. And then at Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33, I'm going to read you this. Behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant. What is the New Testament considered? The new covenant. So when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Jacob. If we are grafted in, then the new covenant that he's made with them is the same new covenant that we are walking in. Not the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke. Also, I was a husband to them. We're talking about becoming the bride of Messiah. Yahweh was a husband to Israel, but they were deceitful. They were unfaithful. They were idolaters and adulterers. He said, I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws within them. It doesn't say I do away with my law. It says, I will put my law within them. And on their heart, I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So I'm going to go back to Hebrews 10 and read that to you. In Hebrews, they're talking about that Yeshua is our high priest and that we have a better covenant. And many people use these scriptures to say that the law is passed away. So let me tell you what it says in Hebrews 10. And we'll go to verse 15. Wherefore the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their heart. So this new covenant, this new and better covenant that we learned about in the book of Hebrews is the same one we're looking at in Jeremiah 31. I will put my laws in their heart. And here's another one. And in their minds will I write them. He's trying to put his laws in your mind. He's trying to put them in your heart. So if they're in your mind, you will speak them. If you think them, and speak them, you will do them. The Torah never passed away. The new covenant is having them not on a scroll, but in your heart and in your mind. And this will be the law of the millennial reign. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. That's what I just told you. There is no sacrifice but the blood of Jesus. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter in the holies by the blood of Jesus. We are looking at these scriptures today knowing that by the blood of Jesus and walking in holiness, 
We have access to the Father. We can go into that holy place because of the blood of Jesus and because we've chosen to walk in holiness. Okay, so back to Leviticus, and we're going to start looking at chapter 6. So chapter 16, we're going to focus on how to enter the most holy place and make atonement. God focuses, his focus is a don't let happen to you the things that happened to Nadab and Abihu. They came in in an unholy manner. They did things their own way. So there's a certain way to approach the most holy place and we can't do it our way. It's not with our thinking. And he's so concerned with us drawing near to us. He wants us to draw near to him. And that takes walking in holiness. It's to be in purity and to do it in his way. And then in chapter 17, his focus is that we become sanctified. Chapter 18 is all about sexual activities. Those things will separate us from the father. When we get there, we'll talk about soul ties and how some of those things happen. So when we are harboring uncleanness and darkness within us, we put up a wall or something, anything in between us and God. We have, we have put a veil, a heavy veil between us and God because of our sins and the darkness in our lives. So he outlined certain practices and events around them so that Israel will not become like their heathen. And then chapter 19 and 20 are uh, the Torah portion about holiness, which is Kodeshim. It's all about how to draw near to him. We are to be holy. And the final <laughs> chapter is focusing on different types of wrong practices that are going to prevent us from our walk of holiness. So we're gonna start in 16 right now. All right. And the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before the Lord and they died. So what they did was before the Lord, we can't tell what their intentions are. We don't believe that meant that they went to hell. We don't know for sure what it all means, except for as they, attempted to do things their own way, it cost them their life. God tells us how to do things his way because he loves us. He does not want us to perish. And verse two, and the Lord said unto Moses, speak unto Aaron, thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. So God has mercy on us so that we cannot handle his presence. He will come in a cloud to, to uh, cover his glory so that we are not subjected face to face with that glory. We are walking in a sin nature. We cannot handle that glory. I tell God all the time, I want to see the glory. I want to see the glory. But I know when I say that I'm not going to see the actual face to face glory. He will give me glimpses here and there. He will let me walk in his authority. He will drop things in my mind, give me words and knowledge, give me wisdom, and allow me to know how to move in certain situations. But until I see him, the Bible says that when I see him, I will be like him. That's an awesome thing to look forward to. We will have glorified bodies. We will see him face to face. So he says, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. And thus shall Aaron come in to the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat. He is not wearing the blue garment of the high priest. He is only wearing a linen coat. So there's no bells, no pomegranates. There's none of this noise. So this whole story about the priest getting behind the holy of holies and the bell stop ringing, that you could grab the rope and pull him out when he dies. There's no history of a priest ever dying behind the veil with God on the day of atonement. They only go behind the veil one time, once a year. 
and he's wearing a linen garment. He is not wearing the ephod and all the, the, uh, the breastplate, and all the things. He is a lowly person before God. When he comes out, he is a royal person before the rest of the congregation. But in front of God, he is lowly and he is in a white turban and a white linen gown, linen coat. And he shall have a linen breeches upon his flesh, and he shall be girded with a linen girdle. And with the linen miter shall he be attired, the, the, the headdress. These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water and so put them on. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So he ends up going in and out behind the curtain five times. And every time he goes in and comes out, he has to change his clothes. And he puts the same kind of linen on, the linen headdress and the linen coat. Then he's going to take two goats and he's going to present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle, the congregation. And then he's going to cast lots upon the two goats. One lot is for the Lord, for Yahweh. The other lot is the scapegoat. And Aaron should bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell an offering, offer him for a sin offering. But the goat upon which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord. This is a goat that does not die in this process. It's to make atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering which is for himself and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. So he cannot make atonement for the house of Israel and all the congregation until he is first atoned for. This is a pattern for our prayer life. When we come to God, we are to be asking him to shine a light on us, to show us where we're missing him. Where do we have sin in our lives? Cleanse us, Lord. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Because before we can begin to pray for the nations and anyone besides our household, first our hearts are supposed to be clean before God. Then we're going to look at verse 12. And he shall have a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before Yahweh and his hand full of sweet incense beaten small and bring it into the veil. That's the first thing he brings into the veil, the censer, and it's full of burnt coals. The burnt coals are off that altar. The altar fire is the fire that Yahweh started in the beginning when he consumed the first offering on that altar. They have kept it stoked and going constantly. This is Yahweh's fire. So he brings that in a handful of the incense and he brings it inside the veil. So God is already in a veil, behind the veil. He's, I'm sorry, in a cloud behind the veil. And now the incense, you have the smoke of the fire and the incense is thrown up in the air into that fire and it makes more smoke. So now you're, you're hiding God even more. You're veiling God more. So he's in a cloud, he's behind a veil, and now we have the smoke of the incense veiling Aaron as he goes before the Lord. Then in 13, and he shall put the incense upon the fire before Yahweh, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony. And the reason for that is so he will not die. That's the reason why. Yeah. Verse 14. And he shall take of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his fingers upon the mercy seat 
eastward and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his fingers seven times. So we have talked about this. When you walk into the tabernacle, you walk in and you first have the, the burnt offering, the, uh, the altar of burnt offering where the animals are burnt. And then you walk and you have the laver here and you walk into the holy place where you have the um, menorah here, you have the table of showbread here, and in the center, you will have the altar of incense. It's right before the veil, right before the veil. So he's telling them that when he goes in behind the veil and he brings the blood, so when we look to God in that tabernacle, we have our back to the east. Our back is to the east because all the pagan religions turn towards the sun to worship their gods. They face the east. So our back is to the east when we come in before our God. So when he gets behind the veil, when it says he has to sprinkle eastward, then he has to take the blood and go up over his head and have it go onto the veil. Did you guys get that? Yes. Up over his head, back on the veil. And then towards the Ark of the Covenant, seven times. He's gonna sprinkle that blood seven times. So this curtain is getting blood all the time from the outside, from the inside. It's getting, it's getting blood on the Day of Atonement on the inside, on the daily sacrifice, it's getting blood on the outside. So the, the veil is being caked with blood on a regular basis. The altar of incense is keeping the incense, the insects away and out of that thing. The incense is developed in a way that keeps any kind of pest away from this bloody veil. So he's going behind himself once and then towards the altar seven times. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his fingers upon the mercy seat eastward and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. 15. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering. So he first came in with the incense, then he came in with that of the bull. Now he's going to kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil, third time in, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So it's going back and forward. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel. So he's going to make an atonement for the holy place, not the holy of holies, the holy place, which is called the tent of meeting because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. So this tabernacle has been set up in the midst of an unclean people. These are people who have been in Egypt learning Egypt's ways, learning the words, the ways of the world for hundreds of years. And in the midst of them is this tabernacle where the presence of the holy God is residing. He is in the midst of their uncleanness. I would say that as we get born again, his spirit comes in us and it dwells in the midst of us, in the midst of our uncleanness. We are a perfect example of this. Verse 17, and there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goes in to make an atonement in the holy place until he comes out and have made an atonement for himself. So that's what he does first and for his household and then for the congregation of Israel. So he had the incense first, the bull, and then the goat. Verse 18, and then he shall go out unto the altar that is before Yahweh and make an atonement for it. And it shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. 
So now he's taking the blood, the same blood that he used behind the curtain and putting it on the horns of the altar of the altar of burnt offering, which is the first thing you come into the tabernacle and you see. 19, and he shall sprinkle the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hollow it for the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And when he had made an end of reconciling the holy place, making it clean, and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Okay. None of this makes sense to our carnal mind. Going out and putting blood on the horns of the altar doesn't make sense to us that blood would make something clean. It's the Lord, it's Yeshua's blood. It is. Every single bit of this points to Yeshua. Yeah. That's why it is done exactly as God has said. If you remember in previous Torah portions, when they made all the elements that went into the tabernacle, it said, and Moses did exactly as God said. And the children of Israel did exactly as God said. Over and over and over, we heard that. And because of that, when they did open up the tabernacle, the glory of God came down in it because of their obedience. This is what I'm saying about those of us who minister for the Lord and before the Lord. Yeah. If we are obedient, doing everything we can, exactly as he says to do it, his glory will fall on us. The anointing will come. There's something to be said for your obedience. God honors your obedience. You do as he tells you to do. So here he's bringing the live goat before the Lord. Verse 21. And Aaron shall lay both of his hands upon the head of the goat, the live goat, and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel. I wonder how long that took. And all their transgressions and all their sins and putting them upon the head of the goat. And he shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto the land, not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. This goat in the book of Jubilees and in the book of Enoch is called Asazel. Asazel is a goat demon. That is, Satan has brought sin into this world. He's brought sin and death into this world. So when Aaron lays his hands upon the goat's head and imparts all the sin upon him, that's because he is the author of the sin. He is the author of the death. And he deserves to have this place back on him. We've had some conversation recently about reversing the curse. Well, when Satan brings something into your life, and you know it's not from God because all good gifts are coming down from the Father of lights. If it's something that's not a good gift, you just go to your front door, you open up the door and you go, return to cinder, return to cinder. I'm not taking this package. You got the wrong address, Satan. I'm not taking it. Return to cinder. That sin belongs on Satan's head. This is another thing that I thought I saw why I read this, is that often there's conversation in these warfare meetings when they're teaching people to do warfare about when you cast out a devil, where do you send it? Well, some people send it to the feet of Jesus for it to wait for their judgment. and Others will send it to a dry place and whatever. But when we look at Satan is represented by this live goat, then we see him sent to a dry place. He and his demons want to be within a human body. We are a wet place. That's why when the Gardenium demoniac was getting delivered, the pigs said, well, can, I mean, the demons said, well, can we go into the pigs? Because they're still wet and they're unclean. They're happy in the pigs. They didn't know those pigs will go running down into the water and drown. And now you have demons that are going to look for another place to go. So to me, this is a clear picture that when we cast out devils or demons, we send them to the dry place. 
to the wilderness. I also think it's very interesting that when Jesus was tried, he was in the wilderness, and guess who was there with him? He was used to being in the wilderness. Yeah. That's where he belonged. 22, and the goats shall bear upon him all of their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. And Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of the congregation and shall put off the linen garments, which he put on when he went into the holy place, and he shall leave them there. And he shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place and put on his garments and come forth and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make an atonement for himself and for the people. And the fat of the sin offering shall be burnt upon the altar. And he that let it go, the goat for the scapegoat, shall wash his clothes, bathe his flesh in water, and afterwards come into the camp. So this is a requirement for the man who lets go the goat. Did he sin? No. He didn't no. sin. But he was around. But he was associated with the sin. So before he comes back into the camp, he goes through a cleansing to be able to be accepted back into the holy camp where Yahweh is dwelling. Okay. And the bullock for this, this is 27, and the bullock for the sin offering, and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement of the holy place, shall one carry forth without the camp, and they shall burn it with fire, their skin, their flesh, and their dung. So that animal that was sacrificed for their sins, that was for Yahweh, is a complete burnt offering outside the camp. Verse 28, and he that burned them shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water. And afterwards he shall come into the camp. Once again, God knew what was contaminating long before science ever came up with that. And this shall be a statute forever unto you that in the seventh month, so he's talking about Yom Kippur the whole time. In the seventh month, on the 10th day of the month, ye shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourns among you. So here is another thing that you might Consider, when Nadab and Abihu died, it's happening at the time of Passover, when they're dedicating the tabernacle. But because of their not understanding how to approach a holy God, God has told them all of these things, what animals are clean, what are not clean, what's abominations, what's not abominations, how to live before him, how to grow your plants how to not mix seed. All the things that he told them is about how to approach a holy God. So now, six months before this event is to happen, Yom Kippur, he's telling him now, don't go behind that veil until I say so. We do this God's way, not our way. For on that day shall the priest make atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all of your sins before Yahweh. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you. And you shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. The word afflict your souls could mean a number of things. And he tells us later what it doesn't mean. But usually it's concerned, considered a day of fasting, a day of circumspect, where you're searching your soul, where you're searching your heart and your mind, where you're making things right with other men and women, our brothers and sisters, and where we're asking God to reveal in us anything that is unholy. 32, and the priest whom he shall anoint and whom he shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead shall make the atonement and shall put on the linen clothes, even the holy garments. And he shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary 
and he shall make atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation and for the altar. And he shall make an atonement for the priest and for all of the people of the congregation. And this shall be an everlasting statute. This shall be an everlasting statute unto you. How long? Everlasting. everlasting. To make atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as Yahweh commanded Moshe. So the sages will say that this dying that Abihu and Nadab and Abihu did wasn't about their, their, losing their salvation. The, the big thing here is that you cannot approach God who is like a consuming fire when you harbor any darkness in you. How do we know when we are harboring darkness? We don't always know that. Sometimes we have things and he does, he does search that out and show us, Chrissy, but he doesn't do it all at once. It's line upon line, line, line. precept upon precept, yeah. here a little, there a little. People come out of the world and they let go of a lot of things. But then later on, God says, now what about this? Yeah. Now what about that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's an elevating form of increased holiness, as becoming more like him. So when you're doing things your own way, you can be subject to that consuming fire. Light cannot coexist with darkness. So God has given us these beautiful instructions as a father on how we're supposed to approach him, that we first have to purify ourselves. And every single bit of this is pointing to Messiah. And I was really glad that you guys picked up on that very quickly. This is all about the blood of Jesus. So the key thing is to follow his instructions. Everything was pointing to our salvation. It talked about the clothing of the priest. The clothing of the priest, he's only in linen at this point. That's symbolic of a person's character. So God's wanting us to be purified in our character. And when we do that, then we are able to put on the armor of God. I taught this a number of years ago, I guess, and it's still up on YouTube about the armor of God. But we first went through the whole book of Ephesians before we got to the armor of God, because there was a lot of work to be done. When Paul talks about putting on the armor of God, he says, and Finally, my brethren, well, you saying, and finally, because there's a whole five other chapters for you to be able to lay down things, doing things your own way and learning to do them according to God. I personally believe that the armor of God is this helmet of salvation is the miter that says holy unto our God that the priest wears. I believe that the breastplate of righteousness is a breastplate breastplate that they that the priesthood wore they were barefooted so their feet were shod with the preparation of the gospel because all of this is leading to the blood of jesus and we go on about what all the other parts are and that's in that teaching on the armor of god is that it truly is the priesthood's holy garments so there's a there's a timing here that we see from God, that because two people died, he does not want that to ever happen to anyone else. So he's giving them instructions in plenty of time so they don't ever go behind that veil until he tells them, and he tells them exact day, seventh month, 10th day, don't go back there until I say so. That helmet of salvation, the word salvation in Hebrew is Yeshua. So it is the helmet of Yeshua. That's what that miter is. So he tells us, Yeshua tells us, that we are supposed to have his mind. He said, let this mind be in you, that the mind that is in Christ Jesus, that's the name of my ministry, is mind of Messiah, because that's the mind that we want to have. If we have the mind of Messiah, then our words and our thoughts, our thoughts will be his thoughts, our words will be his words and our actions will follow. Our actions will be his words 
as well, are his actions. We will then begin to walk in harmony with a holy God. So he first goes in with the bull, then the, the, the goat actually is a, as a cell, is a symbol of Satan. I told you that was in the book of Jubilee and, and also in Enoch. And actually, if you, if you search on the internet for the goat, what's the name of the goat that was released at, um, on, on Yom Kippur? And it'll come up, Azazel. Yeah. So that's interesting. This, this reminds me of, of Revelation. When it says that the Messiah comes, that he'll set up his millennial kingdom. Satan is going to be bound for a thousand years so that he will not be able to deceive the nations any longer. Because it's written in Torah that Jesus is the living Torah. So in the millennial reign, we're going to have the living Torah teaching the Torah from Jerusalem to those of us that are there. It will be then placed in our minds and on our hearts. One of the things that we see for these past 6,000 years is this constant mixture. Ever since the garden, Satan has attempted to mix the word of God. He's tried to place the things of Satan and his corrupt ways onto God and blame God for that. Like wars, quote unquote, holy wars that were fought in the name of God that were inspired by Satan and people were killed. Right. Thousands of people are killed. It's supposed to be a holy war, not my God, but Satan would blame my God for that. There's this constant mixture. So when we come into the millennial reign, there will not be a mixture. We will have the pure word of God and that pure word of God will be in our hearts and in our minds. We know from what we just read, that when we when it talked about Aaron going to the altar, the burnt offer, burnt offering altar, that he is supposed to be getting those coals off of there and then taking them back into the veil and throwing up the incense to make the cloud. So we know that was one of the problems with what Nadab and Abihu did. Their coals did not come off that altar from the fire that Yahweh himself started. There is, at, at the time of Yom Kippur, it's said that that is a time of favor. So time didn't exist for God in the ancient past. Time only begins when there is separation between what is and what should be. So if we're truly in him and he's in us, Will time exist for us? At some point, it, it exists now, but at some point, when we're in his presence, that time won't mean anything. We have fallen out of harmony with him, and we're supposed to be coming that this whole, this whole time of Yom Kippur where our sins are covered and forgiven and placed back on the devil where they belong, on Satan, or the goat that represents Satan, that is called a time of favor. So these are some things that the sages say are a time of favor. A time of favor is reciting the psalm before you pray. That's seen as a time of favor. Every day it's considered an honor to recite one of the psalms or to put it to memory. They're beautiful and they're mainly about the blessings of Torah. On Yom Kippur, they would traditionally recite three psalms because the sages told them to recite a, a psalm before they prayed was, was a, a time of favor. And so why not recite three of them? Right. <laughs> so it's a good thing to start memorizing the psalms and incorporating them into your prayer life. Here's another time of favor. When you have overcome a temptation, we get especially close to the heavenly host and to Yahweh when we actually are able to overcome a temptation, when we're able to walk away and to get victory.
And one other time that's considered a time of favor, and that is when we do good deeds, when we do something for our fellow man. Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. So our light shines when we do acts of kindness. This is what really draws us near to God. This is what makes our light shine. So we, it's not that we want men to see us. It's not an ego trip, but we want them to see the beautiful works of God that are working through us. And that his love is throwing, flowing through us and that our life is a life of selfless service to our fellow man. And it's after Yeshua's example. All of this veiling where God is in the cloud and then you've got the, the sensor with the smoke and, and, and the cloud and all of this is about God's mercy because he just, his presence his raw presence was a consuming fire. That's what did Nadab and Abihu in. So in his mercy for the one who comes behind the veil, there's this covering. He comes in a cloud. They have a veil to separate his presence. And they have the smoke of the incense going up and making it even more veiled. So that whoever, whatever high priest comes behind that veil, will not be consumed. One of the things that we want to do on this day of atonement to begin our prayers off by allowing ourselves to know if our hearts are right before God, we have to be mentally thinking, is there any area that I'm out of harmony with God's will? And before we can start praying for anyone else, we've got to get ourselves back in harmony with God. And then we want to make sure things are right within our household before we begin to pray for others. Many people want to come in and access the presence of God and, and they went to bed last night arguing with their spouse and haven't made up yet. Ask God, where have I failed? And make it right with our brothers and sisters. Okay, so we're going to go because we read everything that they did. They, they, they sanctified the whole, you know, they did everything they they uh, atone for the, the house of Aaron and his family. They atone for the house of Israel. They atone for the holy place of the tent of meeting. They, they brought the goat in and they sent the scapegoat out. And so we're learning all those things. And what, what he's done is he started in the holy of holies and then he came out to the holy place. And it's like the way that you approach a king if you're a bid to come towards a king, that when you're in his presence, you don't turn your back on him and go out. You back up. You back up, like Esther did when she came before her husband. So this is what Aaron is, is doing, but God is instructing him. You start at this holy place where I told you to bring in the incense, and then you're going to back out, and you're going to make atonement for the holy place, and then you're going to make atonement for the altar and ride on out to the point that they send that goat out to the wilderness. So that's an interesting thought as well. So we have to, we have a need for confession, not just assuming that God is atoning. We really need to be willing to confess our sins. It says, he who confesses his sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it's our confession. It's our acknowledgement of where, we, where we're missing God. So they, the, the goat literally bears the weight on his head of all the sins of Israel. One of the things we talked about on Yom Kippur is that that's usually a day of fasting. One of the good things about fasting is that your prayers usually are more effective when you're fasting. Um, one of the things that, that I learned to do when I was fasting as a young person is that if I got hungry, I would go pray in the spirit. It would, it would make that hunger mm -hmm. pass. And they say that when you're fasting, that the hunger really only lasts like 10 minutes. If you can get past that 10 minutes, it'll let up again. So there's periods where the hunger starts, but if you'll pray through that or drink water, that you can get through that and your fasting will really make your, 
occurs more effectively. On the Day of Atonement, we're supposed to totally deny ourselves, not do any kind of work. It's called the Sabbath. It's supposed to be treated like the seventh day Sabbath. So God has made a way for us to be made holy despite of the sins of our past. So leading up to Yom Kippur, there are 40 days, which are called the 40 days of Hashiva. We've talked about that before. We actually did some of that last year. The 40 days of repentance, and it starts in the previous month of Elul, and then it goes 10 days into the month of Tishri. They believe this is actually the 40 days that John the Baptist was preaching repentance and baptizing people because it's the mikvah. The, the whole idea of the baptism is that we're baptized into the water. We're leaving our sins there and we're coming up new for the Lord. In Christianity, we basically taught that's once. You only need baptized once. But the Hebrews did this frequently. Actually, a woman, every time she finished her cycle, she would go into the mikvah and come back out. When I was in a Messianic congregation in Florida, it was not unusual for people to be saying, I'm going to the ocean for a mikvah. And they would go to the ocean. They'd feel like they had things that they needed to get right with the Lord. And they'd just walk out into the ocean and just dump in and come up praising the Lord because they had, they had left those things that were troubling them. They had done a deliberate act of obedience I've confessed my sin. I'm leaving that in the water and I'm coming back up as a new person. That was done on a periodic basis whenever God dealt with them. So baptism is not always just a one-time thing. It's like a statement of your cleansing. It gets rid of guilt, condemnation, all consciousness and memory of sins. Because a lot of us have times when the enemy is constantly bombarding us and reminding us of our past sins. Yeah. It might be a good idea to make that act of obedience to go into the water, come back up again, and to leave that behind. So I want to read to you Hebrews 9, 11 through 15. But when the Messiah appeared as a Kohen Gadol, or the high priest, of the good things that are happening already, then through the greater and the more perfect tent, which is not made, man-made, that is, it's not of this created world. He entered the holy place once and for all, and he entered not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus setting people free forever. For if sprinkling ceremonially unclean persons with the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer restores their outward purity. Then how much more the blood of the Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself to God as a sacrifice without blemish, with purity our conscience from works that lead to death, but purified our conscience from works that lead to death, so that we can serve the living God. It is because of this death that he is the mediator of a new covenant or a will. He left us a will. Because a death has occurred, which sets people free from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Those that have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And then in Romans 6, 23, it says the wages of sin are death. What is sin but transgression of Torah, according to 1 John 3, 4. John says that sin is the transgression of Torah. And the wages of our sin is death. But Yeshua paid for that once and for all. The new covenant is to have Torah written on your heart and in your mind. The whole purpose is so that we can serve the living God. That is truly our purpose. It's our identity. We are the descendants of Israel. We are his children. And our purpose is to serve him. So what does that tell you about your destiny? That's who you are. 
We're going to spend eternity with him. And he's going to make his throne on this earth after we are ready for him. And Torah is written upon your heart. He's going to bring the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem down to this earth. And this earth will be, will become the cosmic center of all worship of the whole universe with a new heaven and a new earth. So our fall festivals, our holy days begin with Yom Teruah, which represents the day of trumpeting, or that we believe that the Messiah will return then. And then you have Yom Kippur, and there's three things that traditionally happen on Yom Kippur. The king is coronated. It comes from the word kafar, which means to an unveiling. And because we have been veiled like a bride, it's a time for the unveiling, for him to know us, for us to be known. Even as he knows us, we don't know us, he knows us, but he will unveil who his bride is. And after that time, the marriage of the lamb. And then the year of Jubilee is traditionally announced on Yom Kippur. So that will be announced in that year of Messiah's return, and it will usher in the messianic age and the millennial kingdom. Amen. How exciting is that? All right, we're going to read seven. And Yahweh spoke unto Moshe, saying, Speak unto Er Haron and unto his sons and unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, This is the thing which Yahweh hath commanded, saying, What man soever there be of the house of Israel, that killeth an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp or that kills it out of the camp. So no matter where you kill this thing, maybe it's part of your flock and brings it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer an offering unto the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord, blood shall be imputed unto that man. He has shed blood and that man shall be cut off from among his people. So, I don't know if you got this before, but even if you're not deliberately killing something to bring as a sacrifice, like you brought it live and it's going to be sacrificed at the door of the temple or tabernacle, anything that you kill outside the camp, either in the field or on your property, it still needs to be brought and its blood needs to be offered up to God because the life is in the blood. It's sacred to God, whether it's an animal or a human, it is sacred. To the end that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices, which they offer in the open field, even that they may bring them unto Yahweh at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They bring them to the priest and they offer them for a peace offering unto the Lord. When we studied earlier in Leviticus, it was a peace offering that God said the smoke was the food. And when I looked up the word food, the root word was to fight. And we saw that that was a form of spiritual warfare. So these things that are being brought, not because somebody sinned, but because they are offering something to God out of their heart, a peace offering, that is a form of spiritual warfare unto God. It says, it's a sweet savor unto the Lord. Verse seven, and they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils. That's obviously what was happening in Egypt. They were offering, all of you know that I've studied these idols. All of these idols lead back to Satan himself. They build, they build a, an image and then they literally breathe into it and they invite demons to fill up these images, these either stone or statues or whatever. And then a demon takes over and he rules an area, it has a, an area that he will govern. And that's why you had cities that had many gods because this was happening over and over. Well, God says they were sacrificing to devils. That's how that happened. After whom they have gone a whoring. And this shall be a statute forever unto them throughout their generations. And thou shalt say to them, whatsoever man thereof of the house of Israel are of the strangers with sojourn among you, 
that offers a burnt offering or sacrifice and brings it not into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer it unto the Lord, then that man shall be cut off from among his people. He says it twice. Don't tell me this is being offered unto me if you don't bring it here to this tabernacle. Don't tell me you're doing this because you're doing it your own way. Do it my way. Verse 10, and whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or a stranger that sojourns among you that eats any manner of blood, the pagan gods demanded blood. I will even set my face against that soul that eats blood, and I will cut him off from among his people. The life is in the blood. It belongs to Yahweh. We have no idea. We still don't know the power of the blood. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. That's what the blood is for, for atonement. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. It's not supposed to be spilt out anywhere else. It's to be used for atoning for your soul. All this is about Yeshua. It's all about Yeshua. Amen. So what Christy is saying is that all this is about Yeshua and it's never been taught in, in any church she's ever been in. Verse 12. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, no soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourns among you eat blood. For those of you that wonder what a rare steak is, that's serous. The blood is in the veins. It's in the arteries. It's been drained out. When you have a steak with a little bit of pink in it, that's serous within the, within the uh, cells of the tissue. The blood has already been drained out of those animals. And that I got that because I was married formerly to a butcher my late husband was a butcher early in life and whatsoever man there be of the children of israel are the strangers that sojourn among you which hunteth and catcheth any beast or fowl that may be eaten not everything could be eaten he told us what was clean that's why it says that may be eaten otherwise you think anything can be eaten he shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust for it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore, I said unto the children of Israel, you shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh. For the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eat it shall be cut off. What we know about Genesis 6 and we read in the Apocrypha is that the giants were eating human beings. The blood was being consumed and flesh. Verse 15, every soul that eats that which dies of itself or that which is torn with beast, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger, he shall both wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And then shall he be clean. But if he wash them not, nor bathe his flesh, then shall he bear the iniquity. So there is something unclean about that. You need to wash. So we're not thinking that we're going to atone for ourselves apart from the presence of the tabernacle. God's presence is in the tabernacle. You cannot atone for your own sins without being in his presence. That's why we don't sacrifice animals to Yahweh now not even the lamb on Passover. We are required to bring every animal that we kill before Yahweh. All of the blood belongs to God. We're not in Jerusalem. We don't have a tabernacle. And so that's why we don't slaughter a lamb on Passover. The lamb of God has already been sacrificed once and for all. We may eat lamb as a memorial, but we're not killing an animal because its blood cannot be presented before Yahweh in the manner that he has commanded. 
So the priest sacrificed them as a peace offering. When you bring those, they're sacrificed as a peace offering. The Kohen will splash the blood against the altar of Adonai at the entrance of the tent of meeting. It represents the sacrifice of the spotless lamb of God. And it says that the smoke will go up as a pleasing aroma for Yahweh. That's how we sacrifice, not doing it our own way. So then in this chapter, it's showing you that the spiritual deceivers and when they make certain sacrifices to these gods, these false gods, like one false god, they would even sacrifice their own children. And this is a complete abomination. You know this is the origin of Easter and the fertility worship that comes that's associated with Ishtar. This is why they call it Easter. It's named after Ishtar because this fertility goddess was represented by symbols of eggs. It's a symbol of fertility or a bunny that reproduces quickly. The male version of a star was Molech. So I know that we're not supposed to be talking or pronouncing these God's names, but when I'm teaching, I've got to show you who I'm talking about. So the male deity would ask for the blood of your children. And these people would sacrifice their children and then they would dip the eggs of the fertility goddess in the blood of their children. And this is the origin of coloring Easter eggs. We want nothing to do with paganism of the past. And so we're just sharing that with people because there's people that do these things innocently. They don't mean anything by it, but we want you to know what the origin of this and its pagan practices. And then he tells them not to sacrifice to goat demons before whom they prostrate or they bow themselves. So don't eat any kind of blood. The life is in the blood. He says, if you do that, that he's going to set himself against that person. And this was even to not eat blood. That was known from creation. That was part of the Noahide laws. That was known at the time of Noah. And yet all of these giants were eating other human beings. And that law was known not to eat blood, but they were doing things their way and not God's way. So in the millennium, that will be the end of sin and death because it's all destroyed. Satan is in the lake of fire along with the dragon and the beast and the false prophet according to revelations. So naturally, if there is no death, there will be no more animal sacrifice. There will be no more meat eating. So it wasn't that way in the beginning. It was in the eternal past, eternity past, from the Garden of Eden, there was no meat eating. So as much as we want to start to understand and associate with life and the true principles, we will gravitate more back towards eating things that promote life in us, like the green things, the seed yielding things, God's original diet. God does not want any mixture like the tree of knowledge and the good and evil. It was a mixture with a little bit of truth and, and air, and it made everything insidious. It makes it more deceptive. God's tree is only life and there is no mixture. So we learn these things as we draw near. And we're gonna look at chapter 18. This whole chapter is about sexual deviations and so we're going to learn what God says about that. And Yahweh spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, I am Yahweh your God. After the doing of the land of Egypt, wherein you dealt, shall you not do. Don't do what they did in Egypt. Don't do to me what you saw them do to their gods. And after the doings of the land of Canaan. So don't do what they did where you came from. Don't do what they're doing where you're going to. Whether I bring you, shall you not do, neither shall you walk in their ordinances. You shall do my judgments to keep my ordinances to walk therein. I am Yahweh, your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which 
if a man does them, he's going to live in them. It's going to bring you life. I am Yahweh. None of you shall approach to any that is near kin to you to uncover their nakedness. I am Yahweh. Every time he says, I'm, I'm, I'm God, it's me. I'm the one talking. Listen up. The nakedness of their father, nor the nakedness of your mother, shall thou not uncover. This is what it was said about um, Noah when his son went in and uncovered his nakedness. There's a lot of question as to actually what happened there. It says, the nakedness of thy father, the nakedness of your mother, shall thou not uncover. She is thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of your father's wife shalt thou not uncover. It is your father's nakedness. That's what happened with um, Jacob, the concubine of Rachel, that um, uh, Reuben went in to his father's concubine, which was considered his wife. The nakedness of your sister, the daughter of your father, or the daughter of your mother, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover. The nakedness of thy son's daughter are thy daughter's daughter. Even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover, for theirs is thine own nakedness. The nakedness of your father's wife's daughter, begotten of your father. She is your sister, so a half-sister. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of your father's sister. That's your auntie. She is your father's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister. She is your mother's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's brother. Thou shalt not approach to his wife. She is thine aunt. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of your daughter-in-law. She is thy son's wife. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. So when all this is written, these are obvious practices that were going on in Egypt. They were happening all the time. And so they're being told not to be doing those things. Well, many of these things were being done in our nation all the time. I told you guys the other day that I watched the story of Aretha Franklin called Respect. She gave birth about 12 years old because she had an uncle who came in under her twice. She had two children, very young, and then she had older children when she was married. So these things happen all the time. And her dad was a preacher. None of this was dealt with that you could tell. The child was the one that was burying it. You think God judged that? I would say so. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter, neither shalt thou take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness, for they are her near kinswoman. It is nakedness. Now you would think, that a man wouldn't marry his a wife and then marry his daughter. I know personally of people who are married to a woman, divorced her and married her mother. I know that personally. Verse 18, neither shall thou take a wife to her sister to vex her, to uncover her nakedness because the other in her lifetime. So besides the other in her lifetime, so this is what happened with Rachel and Leah. Jacob loved Rachel. Jacob loved Rachel, but he was tricked into taking Leah first. That was not his choice. God is saying, don't do it. There was constant competition all the time. You talk about a vexing life. It goes on all the time, even if you aren't sister. Verse 19, also thou shalt not approach into a woman to uncover her nakedness as long as she is put apart for her uncleanness, not in her cycle. Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with your neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. 
and thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire of Molech. We just talked about that. He is the male deity of Eshtar. Neither shall thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. When you do these things, you profane the name, profane the name of your God. And they're happening out in the open all the time in our culture. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. Neither shall thou lie with any beast to defile thyself. Wherewith neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there too. It is confusion. You found not yourselves in any of these things. For in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. And the land is defiled thereof. I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomits out her inhabitants. We're having earthquakes. We're having terrible storms. We're having shakings. We're seeing the earth wobble. The earth is a vomiting out its inhabitants because of the disgrace and the sin that mankind has brought upon the land. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments and shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any of your own nation, nor any strangers that sojourn among you. Someone comes to live among you and that's his practice. He's out of here. For all these abominations have the men of the land done, which were before you, and the land is defiled. And the land spew not you out also when you defile it, as it spewed out the nations that were before you. For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls that commit it or commit them, shall be cut off from among their people. Therefore shall you keep mine ordinances that you commit not any one of these abominable customs which were committed before you and that you defile not yourself wherein I am the Lord your God. So, so again, I can tell you that I personally know about people where a young boy violated his sister and then as they grew up, he blamed that on her. He never confessed that his sin, he never faced it. And ultimately, because he never dealt with that sin, because he was a Christian, but he never dealt with that sin, God exposed him publicly. All that stuff came out in the open and God exposed it. If you're not willing to confess your sins, God will expose you in his time to bring you to your knees. It's not because he's punishing you, it's because he's drawing you. He wants you to confess your sin, to deal with he's, what he says is an abomination. He does not want us to live in those things. So they have spent hundreds of years in Egypt and they've been watching abominations all the time. And he's telling them, just in case you think this is okay, I'm telling you, this isn't okay. It's not okay with me. I'm a holy God. You're not doing that. When people join physically, they establish soul ties. It has been taught, and I have tried to find this, but I heard another preacher say this, and so I've not been able to verify it. I'm trying to find out where he got this, but he said, when a male sperm enters into a male or female, that that protein from that person lasts in their body seven years. That's amazing. That's amazing. So we are carrying around parts of another person long after we don't even know who they are anymore or where remember their name or where we met them because we have a society that has dating sex. You go out to dinner, you expect to go to bed have intercourse before you go home. We have a corrupt society and the land is spewing us out. So God is saying, I want to address these issues that will cause separation between us. And 
The prophet Isaiah said, your sin has created separation between me and between you and your God. It is, it is our sin that separates us between us and God. God is a loving God. He, he wants to remove our sins. He doesn't want us to remove ourselves from his presence. He wants us in his presence. He wants to protect us. He wants us to have a life of blessing. Sometimes we don't get blessed because we're harboring sin. We're, we're walking in the domain of death in some way. We need to be able to abide under his cover and not allow things or sexual immoralities to stand between him and us. Tells us not to become engaged in fornication and in adultery or any kind of wrong sexual practice. Talking to us about how to be holy, how to be set apart. So the world and what happens in the world is common. They've been doing away with God's ways for a long way, long time. But he wants you and I set apart from the world. He wants us to do things. We're actually in a wilderness experience here. We've come out of Egypt. We're coming out of Babylon. And he's about to take us into the promised land. That's why we need to know this stuff. That's why Torah is yeah. so important. He doesn't want us to copy the things that we see happening in the world. He wants us to live holy unto him. He doesn't want us to live by their laws. But he's telling us, I want you to live by my laws. So how can we take things like Ishtar and equate it with the Passover? How can we do that? Or even with the death of our Messiah? How does, how does any of that have anything to do with the Passover or the death of our Messiah and his resurrection? We're to separate God things from world things. Yeah. So when we talk about a man laying with a man, we know that some people say they're prone. You know, there are priests that are celibate. Paul said he was celibate. So just because somebody says they're prone to something doesn't mean they have to engage in it. And it doesn't mean that we have to be judgmental of them. We're supposed to love people. They're never going to see the love of Christ if we're constantly condemning them. So it's our job to love them. We can separate the sin of the person from the person. And in our loving ways, we can proclaim the love of Christ through our loving ways. Sometimes we want to attack the outward issues, the things that are manifesting, but there's core issues. And sometimes we don't deal with those core issues. We're so busy looking at the outward manifestations that we don't understand how somebody got where they are. So the whole next chapter is about how to be holy. Kodashim is basic instructions that God gave us as the people as they came out of Egypt. He doesn't desire for us to stay in the world. Yeshua said to us, we're talking about how, how to move to higher levels. We've talked about this before. If, if it, thou shall not kill, he said, no, it's worse than that, folks. It's deeper than that. You start hating the brother, you're already killing him. In a way, you're already right. killing him. So we're looking at this growth of holiness and learning how we can change our thinking. That everything in us is rising to the ultimate holiness. We're growing. We're growing. So it starts with Torah. And then Yeshua comes later and he expounds on it. We have the, the commandments that come from Torah. And then Yeshua expounds on it. teaches us in a hierarchy or a higher level of holiness. There's a thought process. So how much more do we think we're going to learn in the millennial reign that we never learn here on earth? We're never going to quit growing. So there's a progression that God is bringing us to a place where we can ultimately be able to dwell with him. He wants to reinstate us into a right relationship with him where we're not harboring any kind of darkness whatsoever. There'll no longer be any sin after the thousand year millennium. We will see him face to face. I talked about this in my presentation in Utah when I showed him pictures of the new heaven and the new earth going down. What a glorious thing. That's a promise to the overcomers to be part of the new heaven and the new earth. Not just the millennial reign, but the new heaven and the new earth. That we will be face to face with God himself. Like a husband and a wife, nose to nose, breath to breath, eye to eye. 
intimacy with God. It's going to require for us not to remain where we are. We need to continue to grow. So the way that we think, the way that we speak, and the way that we act all matter. Our outward actions are byproducts of our mind, of our words. All of it starts in the mind. We're returning to God by our thoughts and our mind. He told us, I read that to you out of Hebrews, that the new covenant is to have the Torah written on your heart and in your mind. It's in our mind will change how we act on the outside. So this scripture says, who can know the mind of God, what the spirit of God is, but you beloved has been given that spirit. It is the spirit of truth that leads us back to understanding. Understanding how God thinks and how he's only a God of life and of love and of light. He said, I created you to be like me, to be holy. And he said, that was because he's holy. You're made in his image. If he's holy, you want to be in his presence, you have to learn holiness. I created you to be like me so that you can have right relationship with me and be holy like I am. It's a beautiful, intimate language. And you're going to see more language, more marriage language in this. And he's going to teach us how to revere our fathers and mothers. Instead of just honor them, we're going to revere them. He's going to teach us a hierarchy of what that means. He first tells us to remember the Sabbath. And he's going to tell us to guard the Sabbath. It's a hierarchy of holiness. So we're going to get started. And we're going to read 19. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord, Yahweh, your Elohim, I'm holy. we got to get that in our heads. This is not a God that we can just do anything we want with. He's holy. You shall fear every man his mother and his father and keep my Sabbath. I am the Lord your God. That word fear is to revere. Before we were supposed to honor them. Now we're supposed to revere them. And we're not just supposed to keep the Sabbath. We're supposed to guard the Sabbath. Guard it. I am the Lord your God. <laughs> Turn ye not unto idols, nor make to yourselves molten gods. I am the Lord your God. <laughs> and if you offer a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord, you shall offer it at your own will. It shall be eaten the same day that you offer it and on the morrow. And if aught remains into the third day, it shall be burnt in the fire. So think about this. It says in Hosea 6, he said, on the, on the third day, I will revive you. So he has been gone two millennial days. His sacrifice that he led and died for us at his crucifixion and resurrection will last two millennial days. And then he will come for us on the third day. That's why what we kill that is only good for two days. We do not want to put more of our sin upon him. We do not want to keep sinning and add that to the sin that he has already bore. He wants us to live a holy life. Therefore, everyone that eats it, so we're talking about the third day. It, he says, if you eat it the third day, it's an abomination. It's not going to be accepted. It won't be accepted as a sacrifice unto Yahweh if you eat it the third day. Therefore, everyone that eats it shall bear his iniquity. So you're going to bear your own iniquity. Yeah. It's not going to be covered. Because he hath profaned the holy thing of the Lord. And that soul shall be cut off from among the people. And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of the field. Neither shall you gather the, the gleaning of your harvest. Well, he's telling us that because he's making a provision for the Gentile, for the widows, the orphans, for those that are not of the house of Israel. Verse 10. And thou shalt not glean thy field, glean thy vineyard, neither shall thou gather every grape of your vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and the stranger 
I am Yahweh, your God. He is making provision for us already. You shall not steal, neither deal falsely, neither lie one to the other. You shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shall thou profane. So it doesn't say you can't swear by his name. It says, don't do it falsely. Neither shall thou profane the name of thy God. I am your Lord. If you swear by his name falsely, that's profaning your God. Thou shalt not defraud your neighbor, neither rob him. The wages of him that is hired shall not abide with you all night until the morning. Pay him what he's earned for the day. Thou shalt not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shall fear thy God. I am the Lord. What that means is, do you think God's not watching you? Yeah. He sees exactly what you're doing. <laughs> this is not funny. It's not a joke. It's not a ha-ha. You do to others what you want them to do to you. Verse 15, you shall not do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. But in righteousness shall thou judge thy neighbor. We are not supposed to be feeling sorry for the people without and judging unrighteously. We're not supposed to be honoring those that have, that are rich and honoring them and judging unrighteously. Verse 16, thou shalt now go up and down as a talebearer among your people. That's gossip. Neither shall thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in your heart. We talked about you do it in your heart, you committed murder. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. If you see him doing wrong, warn him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. Bearing a grudge is huge. We walk around with these all the time. And they don't just hurt the person that we have a grudge against. They hurt us. But thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. I am your God. You shall keep my statutes, everything that we just read, the statutes. Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with a diverse kind. Don't mix the seed. Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed. If you plant a pumpkin and a cucumber, you're going to get something mixed together and it's not even going to be edible. <laughs> Hunger. <laughs> Neither shall a garment mingle of linen and woolen come upon you. We talked about this last week because linen is from flax, wool is from an animal. That's mixing. Linen has a frequency of 5,000. So does wool. When you put them on, they cancel one another out. Both frequencies of 5,000 are healing. When you put on a mixed item of linen and wool, you lose the benefits of both and could actually begin to feel ill. And whosoever lieth carnally with a woman that is a bondmaid, betrothed to a husband and not at all redeemed, nor freedom given her, she shall be scorched. They shall not be put to death because she was not free. So she's continued to be treated as a slave. And he shall bring his trespasses. We learned this in previous Torah portions that if a woman is being raped and she doesn't cry out, that makes her guilty. If she cries out for help, then that can be stopped. And he shall bring his trespass offerings unto the Lord, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, even a ram for a trespass offering. This person that has raped her or laid with her has to. Uh, bring a lamb for a, a ram for a trespass offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering before Yahweh for his sin which he hath done. And the sin which he hath done shall be forgiven him. And when he shall come into the land, and you're going to come into the land, and you shall plant it all manner of trees for food, then you shall count the fruit thereof as uncircumcised. Three years shall it be as uncircumcised unto you. It shall not be eaten up. But in the fourth year, all the fruit thereof 
shall be holy to praise the Lord with all. We have fruit trees that we planted four years ago. None of them have borne fruit yet. But if they do this year, that belongs to the Lord. But in the fourth year, all the fruit thereof shall be holy to praise Yahweh with all. And in the fifth year, you shall eat of the fruit thereof, that it may yield unto you the increase thereof. I am the Lord your God. You shall not eat anything with the blood, neither shall you use enchantments nor observer of times. I would say that's astrology. Not astronomy, uh, Ben says fortune cookies. <laughs> fortune teller. If you remember, this is why Saul died. Saul went to the witch of Endor to have her call up yeah. Samuel yeah. to find out what was going to happen with the war he was going to fight. He ultimately lost his life for seeking out an enchantment. You shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shall thou mar the corners of your beard. This was a thing where they would do, you saw this in Egypt where they had the beards that came down like this and they had no, no uh, beard over here. That was a symbol of them following the goat God. That's why they could not mar the corners of their beards. That's what the pagans did. You shall not make cuttings in your flesh for the dead nor print any marks upon you. I am your Lord. Tattoos have an origin for marking your body for the dead. Do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall to whoredom. Or do we have a bunch of that? And the land become full of wickedness. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. So all these things that we're willing to do, not prostituting our daughters and not putting marks on ourselves and not calling on fortune tellers, but we're not willing to keep God's Sabbath. They're all on the same list. Revere my sanctuary, I am the Lord. Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head. I mean, stand up when someone with gray hair comes into the room. Honor the face of the old man and fear thy God. I am your Elohim. And if a stranger sojourns with thee in your land, you shall not vex him. But the stranger that dwells with you shall be unto you as one born among you. You got to remember when they're born among them, they come into Israel, they do everything the way Israel does because the Torah is the law of the land. In America, I'm not sure we have a law of the land anymore. You shall love him as yourself for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. You shall do no unrighteousness in judgment in meter yard or weight or measures. So don't be cooking the books, just balances, just weights and just ephod and all just kin shall you have. These are all measuring tools. I am your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe all my statutes, all my judgments and do them. I am your Elohim. Wow, that was a lot. We are to guard Shema, his Sabbath. He tells us to not glean everything. This is really a beautiful thing because he's providing for the, the poor and the orphans, widows, and for those that are not part of Israel, those that have not yet come to know him. So we start with the Ten Commandments in the scriptures, but he takes us a little bit higher. He, he tells us to use all these equal judgments. And this is what Jesus said. Love God with all of your mind and with all of your soul, and then to love your neighbor. He said, supposed to honor him with every word that proceeds out of our mouth, and that we are so supposed to regard his regulations. We'll never be able to come into his presence as unholy because he is like a consuming fire. We would be burned up just like Nadab and Abihu. 
things about a fortune teller. You go to a fortune teller or a soothsayer, they foretell things. And their words are so powerful that if I told you, if I was a fortune teller and I told you that something was going to happen in your future, that even if it wasn't going to happen before, what happens is it puts things out into the ethers and it affects the energy. And our words become like self-fulfilling prophecies. I went to the fortune teller and they said this and this was going to happen. And then we begin to speak that over ourselves. It affects the energy and it becomes self-fulfilling prophecies. And that's why if you listen to a palm reader, fortune teller, or a soothsayer, or someone in divination, it will end up bringing the curse upon your life. They're going to tell you something that's going to happen in the future that wouldn't have otherwise happened. But when you hear it, you believe it. It ends up happening. I actually have seen this firsthand myself. I was going to say, you haven't seen it in my Yeah. Still happens today. Oh, well, yeah. It's on the news every day. Yeah, that's true. They, they are soothsayers. Ben says on the news that we have soothsayers and telling fortunes. The things about tattoos, think about this. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. We would not go to the temple in Jerusalem with a spray can and spray graffiti all over it and mar the beauty of that temple. God has made us beautiful in, in his image and we don't need to be doing other things to make ourselves more beautiful than what God has made us. So our big thing is not to allow a division between us. So we're going to read chapter 20 and we're going to close out with that. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, whoever he be of the children of Israel, are of the stranger that sojourn in Israel, that giveth any of his seed unto Molech. I already talked about that. He shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. If you're going to put your kid before this God that demands the sacrifice of your children, you're going to be stoned. And I will set my face against that man, and I will cut him off from among his people because he have given his seed unto Molech to defile my sanctuary and to profane, profane my holy name. And when he says defile my sanctuary, this is not being done in his sanctuary, but when you think about the fact that we are the temple of the, of the holy God, that's defiling the sanctuary. It's a human being that God has created and we're offering them up to another God, excuse me. If the people of the land do anything ways hide their eyes from the man. When he giveth his seed unto Moloch and kill him not, then I will set my face against that man and against his family, and I will cut him off and all that goes whoring after him to commit whoredom with Moloch from among their people. So God expects us to deal with this. If we were to see someone offer their child up as a sacrifice to Satan, it's our job to kill that person according to God. And if we don't, we're held accountable. That's some serious stuff, folks. And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go a whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul and it will cut him off from among his people. Now, I think all of us, before we got saved, dabbled around in that kind of stuff. Most all of us. I know I did. I had to do a lot of repenting over that. What's a familiar spirit? I'll tell you when we finish up. First, he's wanting to know what a familiar spirit is. I don't have time to stop now. So we'll talk about okay. that during our fellowship. I'm going to set my face against that soul. I cut him off from among his people. He wants us to sanctify ourselves. Sanctify yourself. Therefore, and be ye holy, for I, your Lord, I'm your God. He wants you to be holy, and you should keep my statutes and do them. I am your Lord, which sanctifies you. He is our sanctifying power. He's setting us apart. For everyone that curseth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He have cursed his father or his mother. His blood shall be upon him. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, 
the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. That's what was wrong with the problem when they brought the adulterous woman to Jesus. It was only the adulterous woman. The accused man was not with her. There was no need to put her to death if the man was not with her. And the man that lieth with his father's wife have uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them so surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Thank God for Jesus. We'd have a lot of people that were dead. If a man also lie with mankind, as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man takes a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burnt with fire. This is pretty strong. This is not stoning. Both he and they, that they be no wickedness among you. And if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death, and you shall slay the beast. And if a woman approaches unto a beast and lies down there too, thou shalt kill the woman and the beast. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. When they're saying the blood is upon them, it means that they have asked for this by committing these acts. They have willingly laid down their lives to be able to do these things. If a man shall take his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and see her nakedness, and she see his nakedness, it is a wicked thing, and they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He hath uncovered his sister's nakedness. He shall bear his iniquity. He will bear iniquity. He will be cut off from his family. And if a man shall lie with a woman having her sickness and shall uncover her nakedness, he hath discovered her fountain and she hath uncovered the fountain of her blood and both of them shall be cut off from among the people. And thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, nor of thy father's sister, for he uncovereth his near kin, thou shalt bear their iniquity. God is not telling us all this stuff to restrict us. Yeah. He's telling us what gives us life and what gives us death. If a woman lies with his uncle's wife, he hath uncovered his uncle's nakedness and they shall bear their sins. They shall die childless. So one is stoned. Uh, one is in a flame and one is dying childlessly. And if a man shall take his brother's wife, it's an unclean thing. He have uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. This is what happened with John the Baptist, who was telling, yeah. yeah, that he had taken his brother Philip's wife. Yes. You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and do them that the land, whether I bring you to dwell therein, spews you not out. This is all for their good. The land has a mind of its own. It will spew you out. And you shall not walk in the manner of the nations which I cast out before you, for they committed all of these things. Everything I'm talking to you about has already been done in the land. That's why they're being spewed out, so I can put you in. And therefore, I abhor them. But I have said to you, you shall inherit the land and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that flows with milk and honey. I am your Lord, your God, which has separated you from other people. We are separated to be holy unto God. You shall therefore put a difference between clean bees and unclean. Pretty clear, put a difference. And between unclean fowls and clean. And you shall not make your souls abominable with beast or by fowl or by any manner of living thing that creeps on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean. I yeah. told you what was unclean. And you shall be holy unto me, for I am the Lord, I am holy, and I have severed you from other people. I severed you. I set you aside for myself, that you should be mine. A man also, or a woman that hath a familiar spirit, or that is a wizard, shall 
surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Wow. Okay. That is the end of the Torah portion. Let's see if we have anything we need to look at. God desires to draw us near and to be holy. He says, I desire, means that he's saying to you, that you cannot do any of this on your own terms. You have to do it all on his. The character of God is pure holiness. It's totally selfless love. We want to become changed and to become like him. Throughout this entire Torah portion, we see Messiah as our high priest who can enter into the holy, all the holies in the heavens. He is constantly interceding for you. He's atoning for our sins. He's coming back soon. We want all sin put away from us. We are not wanting to place any more sin on him. He's already carried our sin. These are not just arbitrary rules and restrictions. We want to be holy because of his great love that we have for our Heavenly Father. It's what motivates, moves us back to himself and to right living and right relationships. We have to realize God's love for us and in doing all this. God's character has been mingled for 6,000 years. The enemy has been putting his own characteristics on him. Like I said, the world wars Everybody misunderstands who God is because they don't understand his true nature. If we understand that he's a life giver, he's not a life taker. He's a God of love. He has no apathy, but his perfect love will cast out all of our fears. He's a good daddy. And we can come running back to him without fear. So this is the good news through our Messiah, Yeshua that was even being foreshadowed in the Old Testament, in the Torah. We see him at every turn in this Torah. So we're going to close in prayer. And we're going to thank God. Father, we thank you for revealing yourself to us, for your desire to restore us to holiness, for your desire to bring us back into right relationship with you. Father, please forgive us all the areas that we've sinned, ones that we know and the ones we don't know. Please forgive us for our rebellion against you and for mankind's rebellion against you. We cry out like David did, create in us a pure heart, Father. Renew a right spirit within us. Cast us not away from your presence, God. Don't take your Holy Spirit from us, Lord. Give us a right spirit, Father. We long to be in your presence. We long to be under your power and your anointing. We desire to be the bride of Messiah and that we would try our best to make ourselves ready. You've given us the power of the blood, which constantly overcomes sin in our lives. We ask you to help us to crucify our ego and our flesh. You said it's not us that live, but that Christ lives in us. Help us to remember that. Help us not to... Feed our flesh, Father, but to feed our spirit. We desire your ways. We desire eternal life with you. And we thank you for the wonderful love that you've lavished upon us. We thank you for the Sabbath days that you've given us. But Father, we exalt your holy name. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that has washed away our sins, that you've made us holy people before you. God, your word says, be holy like I am. It must mean that we can be. Father, help us to be elevated in our holiness every day, to be more like you, and to walk in our destiny as the children and the bride of the Most High God. We bless you, and we give you praise and thanksgiving in the name of Yeshua. Amen. If you have learned and you liked it, Please give us a thumbs up, share it, and subscribe. And we hope to see you again next week. Blessings from Mind of Messiah Ministries. And all of us say shalom. Shalom. Hallelujah.